Well, we had church Sunday. Um, it was good to see everybody together. Wednesday night, we'll be you know, meeting online like we've been doing. But it's good to start gathering back together. I appreciate y'all uh, making the effort. And those of you that couldn't come, totally understand. It was a mixed bag of emotions. There was some joy mingled in with a little sorrow. It was just kind of surreal uh, not having our people there with us, not, not coming together completely. But at the same time, it was good to be back together. And uh, we look forward to it next Sunday. Until then, we're going to be in John chapter 6, uh, verse 68. To whom shall we go is the title of this. Father, I thank you for my people and that we can gather together, whether it be in church or online, at the worship house, or as we get together through YouTube. And we just want to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. To whom shall we go? Now, I'm just going to do some teaching here. Uh, I'm not going to get all worked up on sitting here one-on-one -on -one with you. John chapter 6, verse 68, Simon Peter said, Lord, who will we go to? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You know, everybody else was turning on God. Everybody else was turning away from Jesus, I should say. The multitudes and the master were not getting along too well with some of his teachings. Um, a lot of times there would be great crowds start following Jesus. The 5,000, the feeding of the 5,000, which was probably over 10,000 people because they didn't count children and women. Um, the multitudes turned away from his teaching. They didn't like what he was saying. It was a very unpopular message. Uh, nobody wants to do that today either. Uh, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but, you know, the message of the cross, the message of his death, uh, people don't want to hear about the blood. People don't want to hear about the, the cross. People don't want to hear about spiritual things unless they're prospering spiritually or if there's ways they can prosper financially even. Uh, that, that draws a pretty good crowd. But certain topics, if you're going to teach on the Holy Spirit of God or teach on things that matter, then people just kind of, eh, nah. there's bleh. But if you're going to give everybody this, well, all you got to do is look at the titles of the number one selling books on Christian websites and Lifeway and places like that. Um, Lifeway took a bunch of them out, thankfully. But here's a couple of things that are selling right now. It says, one book title is, How to Become a Millionaire at 30, A Spiritual Guide to Unlock the Door of Financial Prosperity. People are buying that one. Real Prosperity, Create Financial and Spiritual Abundance. Big seller. Positive Prayers for Financial Blessings. I thought we were going to have a, you know, a prayer thing right there for a second. Uh, abundance, blessings, all that stuff. Next book, Secrets of Financial Prosperity. Next book, Create, Created Rich. You were, you were meant to be this way. Uh, basically, the book is about how if you're not rich, if you're not wealthy, then you're not living up to your potential and your creation. That's what God wants you to be. A spiritual guide to financial personal fulfillment. A divine... Um, Equation for Material and Financial Prosperity is another book. Be In It to Win It, A Roadmap to Spiritual and Financial Wholeness. See, these are the kind of things people are into uh, in the church. And I think the number one women's book right now, number one selling Christian women's book, never even mentions the name of Jesus or has anything to do with Jesus. It's all about you being the best you you can be. Uh, you don't have to go to the church for that. You, you can go to motivational speakers to get that kind of stuff. You know, that's not our job. That's not what it's about. And if you don't have a hunger for spiritual things, then, I mean, what can we do for you, really? Um, so here's what's going on. We're going to back up to verse 67. Jesus said, therefore, Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? And that's in John chapter 6, verse 67. Do you cut and run when things get tough? 
That's what was happening. The teaching's starting to get tough. Everybody likes the I love you, Jesus. Everybody likes the let me feed you, Jesus. Everybody likes to let me let me heal you, Jesus. But then when the doctrine starts getting kind of tough, teaching and preaching about how you should live it, how you need to pick up your cross and you need to do all these things, that there's a price to be paid, that you've got to sacrifice something, that you need to surrender, that you need to give your life completely over to him, that he is the Lord, the master, not you. Jesus never did teach stuff to draw a big crowd. He, he was not a seeker-friendly person. Actually, every time Jesus got a big crowd up, he ran them off. He would be considered a failure in our churches today. Nobody would want him as the pastor. Every time church grows, he gets up and preaches something controversial and everybody leaves. Uh, he wouldn't be thought of as a good leader. I made a comment about one time about trying to lead, but it's hard to lead if people don't follow you. And a guy told me, so well, John Maxwell says that if people aren't following you, you're not a good leader. John Maxwell's stuff is not biblical. It is nothing but businessman models throwing a little scripture in there to make it look like it's something spiritual. Jesus led. People didn't follow. People left him. People abandoned him he even got to the point where he just said to the disciples in our verse right here you don't want to go away too do you so jesus wasn't working on drawing crowds john chapter 6 for 30 verse 37 jesus said everyone the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me i will never cast out he wasn't trying to draw in seeker friendly crowds he knew that whoever the father gave him that's who he would have John 6, 44, same chapter. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. See, today there's a pressure on all our pastors to dance around certain issues so that we don't offend people because preacher, if you preach on that, they might not come back or... Um, if you preach on certain things in the pulpit, you know, certain people won't come. Well, so, I mean, we can't do that. Pa somebody said, Pastor, um, as the pastor, will only preach from the text of encouragement as not to offend. They might not like me. They may fire me. Folks, if the truth of God's word offends you, then be offended. I like that um i mean not that i like it not that i want to offend people but you know if 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 somebody is teaching from the tape now there are folks and they will get up and they will preach and they will offend because they will do it from a soapbox it's not the text and they'll say things like if the bible offends you you take it up with the bible because it's right here in your bible well, not if you took it out of context, not if you're abusing the scripture to make your point because you're mad about something, or you took one word out of the text and you twisted it around so that the text would mean something it never meant. But if somebody is teaching the text in the context, and it's biblical, and it is what it is, and it's being laid out there for you, if you do get offended, then therefore, that's between you and God, okay? If the Word of God offends you, then you can just be offended. That's all there is to it. All right. Um, let's see. So a lot of the big stuff today is about self-esteem, building you up. And we are to build people up, but not at the expense of the rest of the message. That's just part of the message. People, you got to show people they're sinners. You can't have... You can't have a, a, a teaching of theology that leads, leaves out repentance, leaves out sin, leaves out the sacrifice that God made to purchase you. This whole cheap, easy religion stuff about you need to be a better person and God loves you and just, you know, just ask them into your heart and you'll be okay and just continue to live like you want to. And so that's not how it works. It, 
the love of God is a beautiful thing, and it is the most amazing thing to me that God loves us. But you've got to point out that God loves us so much that, you know, he gave Jesus, and Jesus died. Jesus shed his blood for our sins, and therefore we need to repent. If you leave out the repentance and you leave out the sacrifice, yeah, what's the point? Just to make people feel better about themselves. Well, we'll get a bigger crowd. Who cares? We don't need a million more like we got. John chapter 3, verse 27, John responded, No one can receive a single thing unless it is given him from heaven. Now, there was a book, How to Grow Your Church in Ten Easy Steps. Man, I can't imagine. The problem is, growing the church in numerically is not the example. Jesus is my ultimate example. Proclaiming the truth. No matter how hard it may be to, for the people to accept it, it still needs to be given. The truth I'm talking about. Um, John chapter 6, verse 53 through 57. We're still in the same chapter. So Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of my son, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Because my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And no one eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. The one who. Verse 57. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. People didn't like that. Because verse 60, Therefore, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, This teaching is hard. Who can accept it? Now, a lot of people think, well, they, they didn't like that blood stuff, that flesh stuff. Ooh, that sounds like, is he preaching on cannibalism? I'm not going to follow him. Let's move on. No, it's a hard teaching. You've got to take part in me. And when Jesus knew in himself, verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said, does this offend you? What does it take to offend us? Does it offend you? What does it take to make you want to quit? Was it coronavirus, you know, us not having church for a while, does that make you want to quit on Jesus? Is it some teaching? I hear there's some churches right now that are very popular because and people have said, and they post things, you know, well, they don't judge. You can go in there and not be judged. Well, you can go in there and not get the truth. You can go in there and not get the complete message. You can go in there and be told you're a really great, swell person and never be told you need to repent and never need to be told you need to uh, confess your sins and never be told that you need to straighten up your life and do the things you're supposed to do that are pleasing to God. Just continue to do what you're doing. God loves you no matter what. You like that. And we can have some big music. And we can have a grand old time. And we can walk away and feel better about ourselves. That's not what church is for. Church is for us gathering together and glorifying Him. We're supposed to worship Him and glorify Him. And learn from the actual texts. The teachings of the Bible. What does it take for us to get offended to the point where we walk away? Or we do like Paul said, we go after those tickling our ears, itching our ears. Well, for some people, the answer is not much. doesn't take a whole lot to offend some folks. Some folks, a little bit of criticism, maybe someone forgets to thank them for doing something. Maybe you put some flowers out at the church and somebody didn't get up when they did announcements and tell you, what a great job you did putting flowers out in front of the whole church. Are you mad? That's stupid. People, people go in church a lot of times with a chip on their shoulder because they're looking for a reason to be mad. And Go ahead, knock it off, make me mad. Say something I don't like. These are games. These are childish games. Children playing games. 
Y'all y'all know high school's over, right? We don't have to keep acting like idiots. You know, it's always back to that. It's always back to that. <laughs> drama, drama, drama. I don't have much tolerance for people that constantly live in drama. I don't have time for that. I'm feeling old. I feel like I'm not going to be in this world much longer. And drama people just make me, I can't handle it. And if I got to do the stuff to draw people into the church that are all sensitive to get their feelings hurt when they hear real preaching from the Bible, I don't want to pastor those people because it just, ugh, it's tiresome. It sucks the life out of you. Drama, drama, drama. Everybody needs to grow up, put on their big boy britches, and if the Bible says it, we need to look at it in the context. We need to look at it correctly. We need to try to understand it. And if it's a teaching of scripture, we accept it because he is our authority and we accept what he says. I don't like the preacher saying that. Well, if the preacher's saying what's in the Bible, your problem's with the Bible. I'll find me a preacher say what I want him to say. Then he ain't no preacher, honey. Anyway. Jesus was not literally talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And I think they knew that because they said, this is hard. And they didn't say, oh, this is crazy. This is weird. He's insane. No, they said, this is hard. There was understanding. He was talking spiritually. He always used hyperbole to make him, not always, but a lot of times he would use hyperbole to make, use an extreme example to make the point partaking of your walk with him is like eating his flesh and drinking his blood you spiritually need to soak him up you spiritually need to be consuming the things of jesus spiritually he knew he's going to die on the cross i mean he came here to die he knew his suffering was necessary and he knew that his death was going to benefit all mankind why would we not preach that so Jesus gave the people at that time the opportunity to accept him, that he would become a part of them, and they in turn would become a part of him. Um, you are what you eat, but in a spiritual sense. My life is bound up in the Lord Jesus. There's, I can't undo that. I, I came to him. He received me as my Savior. He received me as one of the children of God. He purchased me as a slave out of sin. And even though I'm a dirtbag and I sin and I'm a horrible person, you know, that, that goes back to the thing. Preacher can't judge us by saying these things. He's not any good either. Well, I'm not. I'm not any good. I'm probably one of the worst people in my church. I could, I could confess some things. Just attitudes and the way, the way I see things and the way I see people sometimes and stuff. You know, I got things I work on all the time. It amazes me that God loves me. It amazes me that God gave me Jesus. And Jesus, I have a part in him, and he has a part in me. When I consumed him and he took me, we, we are in this together. Jesus is a huge part of my life. He's everything. And so the invitation that was given to them, they didn't want to receive it. A bunch of them left and because it was hard. They don't to accept that are you are you really going to sell out to jesus is that not hard it must be because if it's not hard why don't we do it why don't we do a better job of it why won't we do more of it sell out to jesus why do men go away because they can't bear it they said in verse 60 of chapter 6 this is hard this is a hard saying it's hard because of human pride you know you don't have to give up your intelligence to believe what's in that book. But you do have to let go of a lot of pride. You do have to humble yourself. You do have to accept that you are a sinner. You do have to accept that you're not worthy. You do have to accept that you do need to repent. And that Jesus had to pay the price for you. And he's not just your buddy. He's not just the big guy upstairs. Lord and savior your master you need to have part with him so what becomes of them 
Well, some are very unhappy and they go back about their lives. Others are hardened. See, the ones that didn't like, there were, we see glimpses in the Bible where people walked away from Jesus' teachings and came back later. Uh, we see examples. Then there's some that just hardened their hearts and kept on going. People quit on Jesus for all kinds of reasons. People don't get what they want. People don't get what they want when they want it. We'll walk away from Jesus because of that. Uh, we'll walk away from Jesus because of difficulties. Uh, well, like something bad happens to you. And then you won't say it out loud, but you blame God. We blame God instead of our own foolishness. Or we blame God instead of the consequences of this creation we live in. Being fallen and bad things happen. So we blame God. Even if we won't say it out loud, people walk away. I've seen people leave church because basically they blame God. Uh, difficulties because it requires time. Time is something we're not willing to let go of and give to God. We want to give them our soul. We want them for salvation, but we don't want to give them our time. Because there's effort and commitment that has to be in place. If you're going to give God that precious time, we'll give our time to everything else. We'll give it to the kids. We'll give it to the schools. We'll give it to the after school curricular things. We'll give it to the ball field. We'll give it to vacations. We'll give it to whatever. We'll give it to work. We'll give it to so many other things. But we don't want to let go of that time because the effort and the commitment that comes to living the Christian life. So a lot of people walk away because of that. Some people walk away because they fail. It's just too hard. I can't live this Christian life. I'm still a sinner and I still sin and I'm wretched. And we quit because it's just too hard. And there's a large crowd going away. And they're not going away completely. They're going to other places where... And listen, I'm not losing anybody in my church to other churches. I'm not saying it. But I see the trend in Christianity and I've seen it in other churches that are having to shut the doors because a lot of the people want it all sugar-coated easy and entertaining if it can be easy and entertain me and sugarcoat the message they will leave a Bible teaching preaching church that's solid is trying to help them be the Christians they need to be to go to the easy entertaining the, the sit at the cool kids table. It's all high school. And it's all sad. And then there's the other individuals that fail because they just never really know Christ. And they fall away. There was a time in America. And I'll close with this. There was a time in America where everybody joined everything. The 60s and 70s especially. Clubs. Culture changed. There's whole papers written about this. Uh, I was talking to a doctoral student who was doing his thesis on this. In the 60s and 70s, if you had a club, 52, people would join the Moose Lodge. They would join the community center thing. They would join the Tupperware Club. They would join the, the Masons. They would join the, you name it. If you had something to join, buddy, they were about joining it. They were about community and joining things, and they just loved doing all that. Uh, the knitting club, the whatever club, the club, 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 we were all in clubs. Church turned into one of those clubs for a lot of people. And what you ended up with was people that joined the club because the church was a part of their community, and it became like a country club kind of thing for a lot of people. And that doesn't fit with these texts. <laughs> Eating his flesh, drinking his blood, spiritually consuming him. Church is so much more than just, I want it easy and entertaining. Church is so much more. You're the church. You're the body. And if you want all that easy peasy stuff, you're not going to grow. You might have a sense of community. And you might have a sense of feel-goodism. And feel you like that whole God is my friend kind of thing. And... 
you know, Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But at the same time, you can't throw out the stuff that's necessary. We want to eat our ice cream, but we got to eat our vegetables too. We want to have the, the party. We, we, we want to have, you know, what is that thing? Pep rallies. Everybody loves the pep rally, but nobody wants to get in there and break bones and sweat blood on the field. But we want to cheer, and we want to say, yay, and we want to say, go get them, boys, and we, all this stuff, and hooray. And we want to sit down at the table, and we want to eat our cotton candy, and we want to have our M&Ms, and we want to have our ice cream, and we want to have our peach cobbler. But then somebody comes up and gives you a bowl of vegetables. You know, we don't want those. You can't live that way, physically or spiritually. So the problem is, immaturity and then Simon Peter said to Jesus in verse 68 Lord who will we go to you have the words of eternal life why would we go for sugar-coated easy entertainment why would we walk away because we're sinners why would we walk away because it's not easy why would we walk away because of difficulties why would we walk away because we didn't get what we wanted and when we wanted it? We're talking about the one who has the words of eternal life. Sometimes that's not easy. And sometimes it's hard teaching. And so I'll pick up some more on that next time. And uh, we'll talk about, well, the Pharisees and the uh, Sadducees and things like that, the Essenes, the philosophers. We'll talk more about it next time. Just, uh, I just want to encourage you and ask you, you say, that doesn't feel very encouraging. Well, whatever. Um, what does it take for you to walk away? What does it take for you to quit? Is it all, I know we're frustrated with how things are right now in our country and how things are in our homes in the way things are working you know is that god's fault or do we use these things in this time to grow closer to him and say you know what that is a hard teaching but these are the words of eternal life and he's the one with the words so i'll go to him father we thank you for the truth of your word and we thank you for those who, who did not walk away and did not forsake your teaching First in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.